are three stories located in three typical American cities. One seafaring, one manufacturing, and one road. But they also form one story to be found all over the USA. A story of how democracy is doing in the midst of war. Let us begin where America began, on the Atlantic coast. In the Norfolk Navy Yard, there's a machinist named Wesley Goodrich. Lives in a trailer. Used to live in a six-room house about 50 miles from Norfolk. But Goodrich wanted to do war work. The day he heard the government war housing project was opening up, he went over. The project wasn't completed. In war, we don't wait for the grass to grow. These homes were being occupied ahead of schedule. Schools wouldn't be up for a few more months. But they moved in. The youngsters didn't mind. No American kid is going to run around on school for very long. The parents got together. And Mrs. Goodrich sprang an idea. Why not start up the schools right in the newest batch of houses? Good idea, said Mr. Lowe. Practically overnight, his assistant, Victor Perth, procured equipment. Norfolk's married and retired people came to work. Also, some of the war workers' wives, who had taught school in other parts of the country. This school was just like home, the kids said, the same kind of house. It never occurred to the citizens of Alexander Park that they did anything notable here. Schooling, especially during this war, they said, is one thing that has to be made no matter how. Like their pioneer American forebears on this coast, they knew how to get together and make out with the materials at hand. Their war settlement even looked a little like our earliest American settlement, like the first kind of American place. And here's the latest kind of American place, Detroit, the latest, the newest, the most automatic. 40,000 new people in Willow Run, more thousands coming. Alan Kuhn, electrician on motor assembly. Phyllis Harris, a farm girl from downstate. Kenneth Watson, chief inspector on final assembly, formerly in the automobile business. There were no houses here. We're building houses fast as possible, but we had to build the war plants first, the way a good farmer first puts up his barn. So these workers bought trailers. <laughs> Watson can never get used to his turn on night shift. Keep quiet, your daddy's trying to sleep. Can't you keep those kids quiet? They haven't anywhere to play, she told me. Okay, said Watson. He had an idea. There were a lot of old WPA tool checks around, and the WPA was going out of business. A union representative signed with Kenneth Watson as custodian of six of the shacks for use in a recreation project. <laughs> One of the boys, a graduate of the University of Michigan, borrowed some trust from Ann Arbor. Alan Kuhn put in some trust. So did 
fill us out. In no time at all, the place was built. Not exactly palatial. We can do a better job later. Soon as some of the nursery school and recreation projects for war workers get underway. In the meantime, the people at the bomber camp set up their own day nursery. And in the evening, there was a place to gather. Bill Pobmeyer and Mrs. Ballard, Phyllis Harris and Willard Martin, the coons and the what? These war workers, too, in the new world of Willow Run, followed the old American tune for getting things done. Join hands and go to it. It's a tune that goes all over the USA, from the city back into the country. West, where the rails follow the ox trail of the pioneer Mormon migration into the Fertile Valley. At Ogden, the rails branch off for Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle. To this junction, the war brought Air Force warehouses, vast naval supply depots, acres of arsenal, and one of the biggest army supply depots in the world. There simply weren't enough people to man all these new enterprises. The army yards became clogged with unloaded cars, urgent cargo, food, clothing, tools of war. It couldn't wait. General Talbot sent Colonel Rice to make one more attempt find help. There was Cache Valley, richly populated. No idle hands here, though. Farmers, teachers, storekeepers, all busy. Nevertheless, Colonel Grice and Jack Shelby of the United States Employment Service met with the mayor and town leaders. Also, the deans of the State Agricultural College in Logan. And they formed a plan. The Sundays of the people of the valley were like Sundays all over America. Until the army asked for help. The people responded. At 4 a.m. of a Sunday, the school bus started clear across the state line. From all over the valley, school buses pressed into Sunday service made connections with a special Sunday train. From Willard, from Clarkson, from Brigham, people came giving up their day of rest to work for the army. Valley turned out. They unloaded 50 cars, 100 cars. They stacked a thousand boats. Rustoka College Boxing Camp. They stacked a quarter of a million shovels. William Anglin, editor. Amos Grissom, farmer. Maroney Dane, clerk at Tingle Store. They loaded iron for construction. H.C. Davis, math teacher. They assembled train loads heading out for the front, all over the world. Every Sunday, 10,000 man hours of labor. A stuff of war checked in, headed out, on schedule by the people of Cache Valley, Utah. 
Same as the people of Detroit, Michigan, Norfolk, Virginia. People in a democracy where any man can take the initiative, where every man knows how to cooperate. That's how it works in peace. That's how it wins in war. <laughs>